afternoon everybody or evening or morning depending on where you are you have made it this is terzaghi day 2021 the sixth time that we have celebrated terzaghi day at the geo institute my name is brad keeler i'm the director of the geo institute if you don't know anything about GI, this is a great time to find out. GEO Institute is part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. We're a technical society within a technical society. We have about 12,000 members, almost all of whom are geotechnical engineers or geologists. You are probably also wondering, Terzaghi Day, this is the first time I've heard of this, or hopefully it's not the first time you've heard of it. When I started at ASCE, I thought what a great way for us to be able to do outreach to the rest of ASCE staff about something important to GI, and that's the birthday of the father or the grandfather, depending on how you consider him, of soil mechanics, Carl Terzaghi, he was born on October 2nd, 1883. So over the years, we've had different guest speakers come into the building when we were in the building, and then last year, when we were virtual for the first time, we had ASCE President Guna Gunalan. This year, I thought what a great thing it would be to have a Terzaghi on the show. And it is not just any Terzaghi. It's Sergei Terzaghi, who's a civil engineer himself, works for Arup in Australia. We have a sponsor today, and that is GeoPeer. And at this point, we will be hearing a few words from them. So I will do one more thing. Well, first I will thank GeoPeer, and then I will do one more thing before I introduce Sergey, and we have his presentation today. Last year, about this time, we were very fortunate at GI to get a $125,000 matching gift from GI past president Ed Cavazangian for our student participation fund. It funds our student competitions, career fair, various other things that students do throughout the year with the society. It goes without saying that this is an excellent use of this fund of this funding, excuse me. We thought we needed to create a way to keep up the momentum from last year's uh, giving campaign. We did a great job. Our members did a great job contributing. And so we've created something called the 96 Club. GI was, of course, founded in 1996. And as an homage to that date, if you donate $96 every year to the Student Participation Fund or one year, you'll receive a 96 Club pin, which we will be launching the design for that shortly, and a gift every year from GI. And for our inaugural gift this year for the 96 Club, it will be a Carl Terzaghi bobblehead. We are working through the designs on this and we expect to have those posted very shortly. But for more information on the club, you can go to geoinstitute.org Org, simply click student participation fund. It's one of the tabs at the top and you will get a lot more information there. So now on to our speaker. You will have noticed that Sergey has the same last name as Carl Terzaghi. That is not a coincidence. He is his grandson. Also not a coincidence is that he is a civil and geotechnical engineer. He works for Arup in Australia. He is the geotechnical leader for the Americas at Arup. He has over 30 years of experience in the geotech field, and his work encompasses pretty much everything in geotech, including desktop studies, investigation, analysis, design, construction for highways, tunnels, railways, pipelines, embankments, dams, marine offshore projects, foundations, excavations, 
now I can take a breath. That was a long list. So it goes without saying that he's built quite an accomplished career for himself over the years. And he got up very early to do this with us today. And for that, we are very grateful. So Sergey, joining us from Australia, thank you so much for being with us on Terzaghi Day. And we really look forward to your presentation. Right. Thank you, Brad. Thank you all. I'll just flip over. Hopefully it's all working. Right. Here's our gay day. Um, as I say, thank, thank you all for joining us. I'll give a, a brief overview of who am I. Um, even though Brad's done a very good job at introducing myself. What do I do? And then the influences, um, Carl's influence, things that, uh, about him, what he's written, what he's done, that um, influences me, the way I work, the way I do things. I'll spend a few minutes towards the end is where's the greater family today? I'm sure there's a lot of people asking that question. And then I'll finish up with a um, brief slide of where to find more information or those who want to track down uh, various bits of, of information. Who am I? Well, I'm going to start off with some personal history. This was in, um, I think in the invitation here, I was born in Eugene, Oregon. I had three years there. I moved to Kobe, Japan in 1965. Um, when I was three years old, I went to a local nursery school there. So I was a blonde head in the sea of um, black hair. Um, we moved to Geneva um, in 1966. We went by ship to Karachi. Uh, and then we picked up a Series 2A Land Rover for the car buffs and drove to Geneva. Um, a rather difficult journey back then, um, even more so today. I learned to read it and write in French before I did the same in English, also do ba basic arithmetic. We moved to Santa Cruz, um, California in 1969. Again, by ship and by car, we shipped our car in the same same vessel. Uh, we moved to Palmerston North in 1973 via Central and South America. Um, same series to Land Rover and we shipped the car um, to New Zealand. We were quite a long time in, in New Zealand as you'll see. I did spend a year in Steyr, Austria. I'm still doing high school. Um, I learned German there. I was with relatives. Um, got to know the Austrian side of the family, moved to Christchurch in um, 82. Uh, I spent a year on the dairy farm before moving to, to Christchurch. I was milking 400 cows, um, amongst other things. Um, I also decided I really didn't like mechanical engineering, ended up in civil engineering. Uh, graduated in 85, moved to Auckland, where I started my professional career. Um, then moved to Australia in uh, 2005, 2006, um, where I'm, I'm now based. And I had a two year stint in Los Angeles during that period. My professional history, I graduated from University of Canterbury in 1986. I started with a firm called Murray North in 1985 in, in Auckland. Um, where I spent three months in Singapore as well. I, Mary North was acquired by Woodward Clyde in 1991. And during that time frame, I had multiple trips to Denver, to Oakland, to Pacific Islands, um, and really started working throughout the um, Pacific Basin on, on a range of projects. Woodward Clyde, was acquired by URS in 1997. I moved to Sinclair Knight Mertz in, in 2000. And they moved me to Sydney um, in 2005. And again, that expanded um, really the reach, uh, working really working throughout the Pacific Basin. And then I moved to Arab in, in 2009. Um, 
And really, throughout that time, I, I ended up working on this incredible range of, of, of projects. And, you know, what it's become clear, you know, when people ask for me, you know, I, I say I work as a geotechnical engineer, but I don't really specialize in, in one area. You know, it really depends on the time frame and, and what, what's at hand. And at any given time, I can be working on a wide range of very different projects. Um, you know, it might be dams, it might be tailings, it might be um, tall buildings, it might be ah. um, reclamations, um, building foundations, um, subsidence studies. So, so it, it's very, very hard to say that I have a true specialty, but I do have key key interest areas: soft soils, crushable soils. Crushable soils are soils like your pumice or your um, calcareous um, or diatomaceous materials. Some of that comes from one of my very early jobs, um, where we were building a wastewater treatment plant on a thick bed of um, diatomaceous silts. And we put on a surcharge and the surcharge went down like a, a rocket. Um, oh, 1.6 meters of, of settlement. Um, yet, and this was under a seven, seven meters um, surcharge um, or 21 foot surcharge. However, that was built out of pumice, so it wasn't really that high. Um, probably more equivalent to, say, a nine foot high surcharge of, of normal material. But the new new tanks only settled like um, half an inch. So this huge difference in, in behavior um, between your normally consolidated and your unload reload stiffness residual soils. In Auckland, we have a lot of residual soils and they behave very, very differently. Um, and this is something I found, you know, working in Australia and elsewhere in the world. Constitutive models. You need to understand what are the models you are using, um, whether you're doing a hand calc or whether you're using a, um, the latest finite element or other numerical model. You need to understand the shortcomings, and I'll come back and onto that in, in, in a minute. I think something that's really strong, and I think that we're losing sight of, is integration of geology and geotechnical um, engineering. If you're a geotechnical engineer, you need to know the geology of the project you're working on. What is the geological and site history? You can have something that's described as a soft clay, but without understanding why is it a stiff clay, you do the wrong things. Um, I have sites where I've got a stiff clay because it's been genuinely over consolidated by previous weight. Also adjacent to a stiff clay that's there because of cementation bonding, um, through the geologic process and they behave in completely different fashions and then you need to apply different models and, and, and different thinking to each. Of course, also proper application of, of theory to, to practice and a lot of what I do now is making sure people are thinking about the fundamentals and um, how you apply those correctly to the project. And as a consequence of, of age and time, I'm, I now work more as a technical advisor and a reviewer on, on, on major projects rather than, than doing things hands on. I think it's also worth noting that I've lectured at um, various numerical modeling workshops globally since about 1996. This is enough about me. Um, I think it's worthwhile uh, talking about Carl's influence on what I do. Um, 
and really what what it means some some key thoughts i think that's still relevant to the um uh, practice as a whole they will start off with family influence my parents generation are all biologists that's my mother and father they were microbial biologists my aunt uh, was a radiation biologist, my half aunt, um, basically worked as a farmer, married a biologist. Um, so it's quite interesting the way that the people moved from um, being engineers to being biologists. Um, majority of my generation are also biologists but you know we're a very um, diverse group as it turns out now there is one one of my cousins who might well be on the call um today um is works as a um, geotech he's also works as a lawyer and then uh, one of my austrian cousins are uh, is a mining engineer everyone else has gone into some something else my father always struggled to balance um, his time between family work and recreation and all of that comes through um, the way that he has balanced and probably influences a lot of my attitudes today well, i've always been into rocks i don't know why um uh, I've al always enjoyed that, um, but I've never really enjoyed um, pure, pure science, and that influenced my own uh, decisions into engineering and um, civil engineering in particular. I was aware of Carl's work from an early age. That was, of course, um, natural because of the books um, that my parents had um, from him and about him. But of course, the impact that he had, what it meant, meant nothing to me until I became a um, an engineer. So that was some of the family influences. I think one other thing that I haven't put on the slides is my grandmother, Carl's wife, Ruth, was an accomplished engineering geologist. And that's something that not a lot of people are aware of. He, her influence on his thinking and the way he did things was, was profound, um, just simply because she opened his his eyes to a lot of things about geologic consequence, but also the way geologists um, reported things, um, looked at things, and, and was able to also provide a sounding board for a lot of the work that he did. Ruth also wrote a one and a half page paper that won um, one of the top in Geologic Society awards probably one of one of the most influential papers around certainly uh, for its brevity really important and that was looking at the spacing between defects and correcting for the difference between your strike of the defect and the the strike of the of the face that you were mapping at so all very important stuff i'm going to put some quotes on um uh, that are from Carl or, or reportedly from, from, from Carl. And you'll think back on, the, on some of the things I talked about in terms of what I do and some of the comments I made, but I think I'm putting them there also just to trigger some discussion and, and thoughts. Mathematicians are useful animals who should be kept in a golden cage and fed problems judiciously. That, that, really sums up a lot of his thinking um you know yes he appreciated theory and the importance of, of theory to give a framework for decision making but dogmatic influence on on think on theory on uh, mathematics was a problem because 
soils are not straight numbers. When, when we measure a property of a soil, what are we really measuring? How accurate are we really measuring it? And do we understand the variation of that property um, through the entire stress strain um, range that we are applying? That doesn't fit into simple mathematics and certainly not in terms of the mathematics that we that Carl had available. You know, he had um, slide rules and log tables and, and longhand arithmetic to deal with um, a property variation of, say, plus or minus 30 percent, which is quite typical. Um, and that's at a single pr uh, pressure range. You know, given that soils are so nonlinear, um, that that property can change quite significantly. And it's dealing with, with that. Um, and, and it's something that I think we lose sight of today is that we get too hung up on, on our black box computers um, programs without asking ourselves, what is are we really being told? It's not a black and white mathematical answer. Um, and, and it's something that we need to go back and, and think about. Engineering is a noble sport which calls for good sportsmanship. Occasional blundering is part of the game. Let it be your ambition to be the first one to discover and announce your blunders. If somebody else gets ahead, take it with a smile and thank him for his interest. And if you begin to feel tempted to deny your blunders and face of reasonable evidence, you have ceased to be a good sport. You're already a crank or a grouch. This comes from um, clients, consultants and contractors. Um, that, which should be a, essential reading for anyone who aspires to be a, a geotechnical engineer, along with what I'd call the companion papers of um, Ralph Peck and John, John Dunnicliffe. Um, all really essential reading and, and highlighting some of the philosophies that we need to be thinking about. We need to be challenging ourselves. Soils are not, or geotechnical engineering is not something that you can just go and follow a recipe. Every soil is different. Every project is different. You cannot take copy and paste what you did before and say it's all going to be OK. We need to look at it. You need to think it through. You need to look both at the details, but also the wider picture. What is the real question that you need to be looking at? And, and for me, this is really, really important because for whatever reason, many of my early projects have been literally um, state of the art. And there was no precedent. There was no recipe for me to even look at to give guidance. And then so I need to, to follow through. I needed to look and, and understand the, the fundamentals of, of the science, uh, of the art, and, and make decisions on that basis. And, and that, of course, meant I made mistakes. And I needed to find them first before other people did. The worst habit you can possibly acquire is to be uncritical towards your own concepts and at the same time skept skeptical towards those of others. Once you are at that state, you're in the grip of senility regardless of your age. This is always an interesting one because while you need to be very critical of your own And, and you need to be willing to accept those of others. You need to be have that same critical eye at other cons, at what other people are saying, uh, not not just to to challenge them, but to make sure you're understanding what they are are saying, why they are saying that. Understand where they're coming from because they may be coming up with another facet of, of the truth. As I said, a lot of the projects uh, that I, I worked on, particularly in my younger years, were then state of the art. And 
charting unknown territory, working with residual soils, working with the crushable soils. So much is still unknown, undocumented, and, and you need to, to look and, and challenge very, very carefully and keep an open eye towards what's, what's really happening. There are lots of other things of that, that I could be saying. And, you know, we, we, we can carry on for a long, long time. But I think one of the things that are really important is, is keeping an overview. What's important? What, what are you? What is the problem you are, are looking at? Understanding the limits of your tools. You know, we, we have computers. Um, which are very useful. They enable us to do calculations. But uh, I draw your attention to the first quote I put up about math mathematicians need to be kept in golden cages. I'm sure that today he would say the same things of the computers. We get blinded by the speed of the computers and forget to look at the fundamentals. There are very few problems which you cannot solve, at least to first order of approximation, um, just by using the same tools that my grandfather and his colleagues had. And I have demonstrated that repeatedly on many projects, even those I'm working on today that are very, very critical. We, we need to understand the tools that we are using and whether they are investigative tools or, or the, the latest um, fancy concept or, or, or program. What we also have to be aware of is how the demands on engineering ha has changed. In my grandfather's day, society accepted major deformations as a result of infrastructure projects. You go through like the Chicago subway projects, people shrug their shoulders of um, the soil underneath the building settled by 18 inches as, as a consequence of the movement. They just had an army of people going around, jacking up the building, filling in the, the um, settlement troughs and, and making everything good. Today, we're in a very different environment. You'll have an army of lawyers chasing you if something moves by as little as an inch. Yet, has our investigations really improved? Have our calculations really improved to that quantity? I don't think so. If, if we are serious about working to those sorts of tolerance, and I've had projects where we've had to work um, to quarter of an inch um, tolerance, and that's not a, a major scientific type project, that's just an everyday type, type project. You know, we, we need to think very differently about the tools that we use, the investigations that we use, how we apply the knowledge that, that we have. We need to go back and, and really understand the fundamentals and, and apply those rigorously and you know push push the boundaries. We think we have a very good understanding of, of soils. We have a long way to go and a lot of, of what we learn on a day-to-day -day basis needs to be updated. Much of what we do today is in reality, not that much difference to what my uh, grandfather did, despite the fact that uh, we have all these modern tools. The one thing he didn't have was geotextiles. That may well be one of the more interesting advancements from, from his day. And, and it's so, something that we need keep needing to come back to is what are we doing? Why are we doing it? I think some other things that that are are relevant, you know, being who I am, being the grandson, working in New Zealand suited me. 
I had a low profile there. I could develop at my own pace. There's challenging geology, challenging geotechnical materials there, as I've already um, alluded to. I was able to develop an appreciation for modern tools, yet retain um, that equal appreciation for the original manual skills. You know, the Taylor's charts, the various other charts um, that we have still form an essential part of my armory, even though I'm quite at ease at using tools like Plaxus and um, other finite element and finite difference programs. Um, they all f form part of my, my t toolkit. And it, it's something that I think people forget is that with geotechnical engineering, you need a very full um, toolbox because it's not a one size fits all. Um, and, and you know you're working out on 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 site uh, remotely. You may not have power. You need to have ways of calculating things um, without all the modern accoutrements. Um, and yet also you need to have a set of eyeballs. Um, you know you read a lot of the original stuff. It was very evident, Carl felt the need to understand the geology of the site before he could develop a design. And it was very common to have notes. Carl re remained on site for three extra days for further observations in the field. This is something that we're not good at doing today, is making sure we have those proper field investigations, field observations. We're also missing, missing the time uh, to, to sit and think. Um, I remember as a young engineer sitting or standing actually next to the fax machine with my boss. This was in um, 89 and he was um, having a bit of a grunt. You know, when he was a graduate, um, you know, he could write a letter uh, to a client, post it off and not really have to worry about that project for three days until the client got the letter and got back to him. And, and, and back then it was um, a fax, you know, the client expected a fax, you know, that day and would get back um, the next day with a fax in response. Of course, today we have emails and uh, other social media, which is demanding immediately, immediate response, or at least would if you let it. For Carl, well, plane travel wasn't common. He had to go by ship everywhere. And, you know, so he had, for example, nine days going from Europe to the US or returned where he could sit and think and develop uh, his thoughts and theories. Of course, this was uh, assisted by the fact that he had very good memory. So he could remember the details of whatever project he was working on in a way that. I think a lot of us would struggle with today. So that's probably enough on the the um, influence. I'm sure a lot of you have asked about uh, family. And as I've alluded to, we're now largely dispersed through Austria, USA, New Zealand, and Australia. So Carl's sister Ella. Um, grew up in Graz, remained in Graz, married in Graz. Her family has remained largely in Austria, um, dispersed throughout Austria, to be honest, uh, but largely in Austria. Um, Carl's first daughter, who's my half aunt, um, they're largely in Austria as well. Though one of his great granddaughters, um, daughter of one of my cousins, now works as a mining um, engineer and is somewhat mobile um, throughout Europe. Um, Carl's son, my dad, um, microbiologist, he's now retired in, in New Zealand um, with my siblings um, in New Zealand and the US. 
used to be in Europe as well, but one of my brothers has just moved back to New Zealand. And then Carl's youngest um, daughter, the radiation biologist, has now retired in Colorado with um, son working as a lawyer and a geo water engineer. And, and um, her, daught her daughter is a doctor um, working overtime. And, you know, if you want more information or want to track down things, um, you know, NGI has the Terzaghi and Peck libraries. So the vast majority of the paperwork, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, resides in the Terzaghi library at, at NGI. You'd need to speak with, with them if you wanted to have access. What they don't have, I believe I have the majority of, um, and certainly I have a lot of the slides from his various talks and, and stuff like that, which I'm trying to get scanned in for posterity. Of course, there are the various universities um, at Graz, Vienna, and there's the two main institutions in Istanbul. And I'm sorry, I, I've forgotten the names of them right now, which is a bit embarrassing given that I visited them both um, fairly recently, but tracking through the history and um, They've changed names and unfortunately I, I've misplaced my notes um, on, on the names. And of course, MIT as well all have various bits of history. There's certainly um, plaques and busts at, at Graz and, and Vienna. Um, for those who are interested, there is of course a plaque on Carl's house in Graz. Um, where he grew up and it's still in family hands. Um, there's also a park um, in the house where he was born in, in Prague, or at least there was when we visited in, in the 60s. Of course, I have to make the um, plug for two key references. The Engineer as an Artist by Richard Goodman, published by ASC Press, for those who really want to know the history. Um, that's a very good read. And also from Theory to Practice in Soil Mechanics by Lawrence Barham et al. Um, that provides a good insight and in, in selection of Carl's papers. Um, and, you know, faults of people who were working with him at the time. Um, a very different um, perspective compared to Dick Goodman's book. You know, Dick spent a lot of time talking with family, um, talking with um, those who are still alive to, to get an understanding. He also learned German to um, be able to read a lot of his original um, writings. Um, and given it was a very old Germanic script that he wrote in, um, that was a major uh, undertaking. Uh, so well done, Dick, on, on that one. I think now I will call it quits and pass over to Brad for um, question and answer. That was great. Thank you, Sergey. I before we get into the questions, we'll do a couple things quickly. You may have noticed a tree behind me, the viewers out there, and you are not stuck in some kind of time warp. That is a Terzaghi tree. We decorate it every year, and the ornaments are photos of past Terzaghi lectures, uh, quotes from Carl Terzaghi. Uh, we have a stamp that Carl was featured on in Austria several years ago as one of the ornaments as well. So we put this up every year for our special occasion. The other thing that we do is we have these uh, Geo Institute mason jars and we make stratified food in them. And so I made mine today, it's a, it's a taco in a jar and we've got black beans, peppers, uh, tortilla chips. Um, what else is in here? Salsa, another black bean layer and more chips. And we have several other entries. You can check those out on our social media feeds as well.
So we'll get into a few questions here from the audience. First, I will ask a few of mine that I assembled as, as you were speaking, Sergey. I noticed one of the first quotes that you put up was from a collection by Ralph Peck. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you is what kind of relationship you've had over the years with uh, sort of that second generation of uh, geotechnical engineers that, that came after Carl and uh, any any special stories about any of them, whether it's Peck or Seed or Arthur Casagrande or anybody from that group? The only one, well, there's really only two from that group that I knew professionally, um, being Ralph Peck and Charles Ripley. Um, Ralph Peck I met for the first time in one of my trips to Denver that, that I alluded to. I took a weekend off, drove from Denver to Albuquerque, um, which was a pretty exciting trip in its own right, um, and spent uh, an afternoon, an evening, and morning talking about Carl. It was a fun fun period just simply because he was talking about his experiences working with Carl about how demanding he was um but really also how he, he behaved and and a lot of that sort of thing and and the very different viewpoint that he had working with them compared to the viewpoint I had from the family side and the stories that I had from um, from my aunts and my fr and father. Um, the time I spent with Vera, of course, in, in Steyr was w with uh, my, my half aunt and that provided a very different background compared to that of my aunt or, or my father and, and swap, taking those stories, swapping those around was a lot of fun. Similarly with Charles, I spent um, a few days with, with Charles, ooh, it was about 1990. Um, so that was always, that was again a, a fun couple of, of days um, there. That was again around about uh, well, early early 90s uh, again i did know L lawrence but I, that was from the time i was in geneva um so of course really didn't appreciate the um connections or the importance um uh, i think what I remember most about Lawrence is up until we moved to New Zealand, we got this huge box of Norwegian chocolates, a uh, one kilo box uh, of Norwegian chocolates every Christmas, um, which we, of course we we rationed, um, uh, you know, have one chocolate um, per member every night. So it lasted about a month. Um, that is probably what I remember most about Lawrence. Now, we did go and visit um, Oslo in GI. I, I do actually have a few memories of, of that trip, even though it's what, six or seven at the, at the time. Um, so yeah, that next generation, I really, outside of those two contacts, I, I didn't know um that well unfortunately I think that's that's a good memory though getting the chocolates every year and i'm glad that i wasn't the only person as a kid who rationed things out like that so that they would last longer <laughs> and appreciate them a little more I, my sister always thought i was weird but who was laughing when i was having halloween candy after new year's exactly um it's always fascinating to me. One of the most fascinating things about the geotechnical profession is that 
there are so many people who still have contacts with the people who were there at the beginning. I don't think there are any mathematicians out there, maybe I'm wrong, who met Ptolemy or Archimedes you know, 2,300 years ago. So it's it's fascinating, one, that the field has evolved so much in such a short time, and two, that we have those connections and those links. It's, it's really cool to me. I want to ask you one. I don't know how often you get this question. Um, you mentioned the dairy farm. What lessons did you learn from working on that dairy farm for that year that you, you kept with you throughout your career? Uh, well, probably the biggest one was that I had no affinity for mechanical engineering. I'm sorry for those who are, are um, inclined that way. Um, but interestingly, neither did Carl. Um, if you followed his history, you know, he did command a test pilot. Um, or airplane testing squadron for a while. Um, so he had to have um, contact with mechanical engineering, but he really disliked it and you know, really did not like driving cars or having anything to do with mechanical whatsoever. Um, it appears I've inherited that, that condition. Um, I, I think some of the other things that I learned well, was really a lot about the importance of redundancy. Um, you know, seeing how things actually behaved in, in, in practice as versus how they behave in the textbooks. And also gain appreciation for sequencing, how you had to sequence things, you know, building uh, fences, building water lines, you know, digging, digging soils um, down and, you know, have a first-hand experience of what saturation does versus unsaturated soils. So, it was more the practical side rather than the theoretical side, I think were the key lessons. Well, that is great. And you gave us a perfect segue here into one of our questions from our viewers on unsaturated soil mechanics. And the question is, how does unsaturated soil mechanics fit into classical soil mechanics? And is there a need for greater integration and reconciliation of those two theories? Um, well, if you, if you follow the academics, of course, um, classical theory is just a subset of unsaturated soils. Uh, so there already is full integration at an academic level. I think there does does need to be a much greater appreciation of unsaturated soils in day-to-day -day practice, particularly in the air areas, Australia, um, Southern California, um, well, actually most of Southern US, um, many parts of Asia, we have very arid climates, or at least climates where you fluctuate between saturated and unsaturated areas. It's always annoyed me I can't use properly unsaturated um, soil mechanics in my day-to-day -day practice. Partly people get so wrapped up about having to design things ignoring suction. And yeah, I can understand the reason for it because there have been notable failures where people have ignored the consequences of, of unsaturated soils becoming saturated. I think a bigger problem and a bigger challenge is for the industry to come up with a proper set of details and principles so that we can use effectively unsaturated soils in day-to-day in -day practice. 
and certainly that's one of the things I'm working on is to try and get some of the basic data so that we can do that. So we're going to skip around to something completely different here. Another viewer question is whether you have any interest or whether you've thought about the relationship between microbiology and geotechnical engineering. I mean, I'm assuming someone in your family must have explored this topic at some point at length and why, why everybody is in these two fields or so many people are in these two fields. <laughs> well, that's always an interesting one. Um, and it's actually some, I know it's a hot topic um, today is, can we use microbiology to generate, you know, self-healing uh, materials, be it concrete or one right now is to apply various waste products and use bacteria to create cementation agents and of course there's always the things that you know as you work through your topsoil and all of that um, you've got the microbial influences on the behaviors in Australia you've got the acid sulfate soils which are basically a byproduct of um, bacterial processes so that lots of opportunities there and I think it's becoming a lot more of an active topic. Um, I think there's um, a lot that we could be looking at there um, in the future as we look to, for a more sustainable future. Um, you know, because cement, lime are not exactly environmentally friendly um, products. No can we do something better? And I think we can. It's just a matter of exploring the, the opportunities there. And I think a uh, place for the questioner to look might be at Arizona State, Ed Kevizangian Center for, uh, I always forget what the full words are, but it's CBBG. If you Google that in Arizona State, you will find it and a lot of work on biomimicry and biocementation and other processes that Sergey was just uh, running down. A good, good place yeah. to start. Yep. So next question, this will be a quick one, but a very interesting one that I never thought of. Have there been any movies made or has anybody thought about making any movies to depict and celebrate uh, Carl's life story and legacy? Not that I'm aware of. Um, I know there have been various clips, short clips taken. Um, I know um, Professor Whittle has some recordings of some of the talks um, that that are available. I believe I've got the slides for those talks. So one of the things I'd love to do is put the two together at some stage. Um, I'd love to take some of the slides um, and basically compare what he was, you know, almost like um, a two screen a talk, you know, here are the slides of what they did back then. This is what we do today. Um, but that's the, the limit. Um, I'm not sure. I'd want to let Hollywood lo loose on um, his early life, um, given the sort of embellishments that they would do and the escapades that he got into. Um, I, I, I think that would not do it proper justice. Which is probably true for a lot of people, <laughs> and, uh, especially at that at that time. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so here's here's another one, a little bit more of a technical one. Um, Jean Louis Brio told a story and tells a story about the three dots still listed on the first bearing capacity pressure charts that uh, Carl Terzaghi developed when there were very few case studies. Uh, how do you see the effect on? Uh, of this on technology and on the future of geotechnical engineering? Uh, 
That's 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 an interesting one. Um, you know, things like the bearing capacity equations. You know, generically. Um, slope stability, there's a lot of these sort of limit equilibrium or, or pseudo limit equilibrium equations. They're simultaneously extremely useful. You know, as I discuss, I use I use them every day. Uh, and or if I don't use them, my colleagues will use them when they're doing the sums. But the limitations both in terms of the derivation and what they rep represent are, I think, also a drag. And I'd really love for someone to approach bearing capacity using uh, modern soil mechanics and see whether we can do something better. Having said that, how well do we know the soil properties? You know, uh, we can get something better, but we're still plus or minus 30 percent. Um, so, you know, it's an interesting question. I think there's a lot of work that could be done there, a lot of very useful work, but at the end of the day, um, doesn't make that much difference. Um, you know, if you look in Ball's textbooks, he compares the performance of three or four different a uh, bearing capacity at the end of the day they all perform equally well um, despite the simplicities and everything else i'm not sure if that fully answers the question but <laughs> i think that was a good answer i want to take that answer and kind of zoom back out and uh, again i don't know how often you get this question when you look at your grandfather's work whether it's in his writings or or just at any case histories that he looked at during his heyday and you see where the field is now compared to where it was then are you more amazed at the advances that have been made in that time or are you more disappointed that more has not happened i think there's elements of of everything there um you know, given the differences in, in theory and understanding compared to what he had back then, and you know, we have to remember he had a slide rule, he had logbook tables, uh, had p pencil and paper. Why haven't we done a lot, lot more than than what we have? Uh, it's at times it's very frustrating. It's quite it's almost embarrassing um, for the profession. Equally, you know, you look at a lot of the landslides we, we look at. You know, the big creeping landslides or any of that. We basically use the same tools he used. And no amount of computing power is going to make any difference. And I think it, it would really behove the industry to make sure that we keep those skills, those very simple tools alive. And um, at that forefront of what we do. You know, I remember um, as a young engineer, we we're looking at one creeping landslide. The single best tool to analyze and understand what was going on was breaking the landslide into a five block model. You know, something that's been around for even before my grandfather's just breaking the thing up into five rigid blocks and applying the forces around those boundaries. That was by far and away the most effective tool, simplest tool. We need to keep those very simple tools um, at, as part of our armory. Um, so I think there's aspects of both. And we're not always good at keeping it simple. I, uh, 
We'll take a few more questions here before we wrap up for the day. And the, the next one is one of our audience questions. Do you have any anecdotes about Carl's sense of humor and about his interactions with with his students or or with the, the word they used here are disciples? But I, I take that to mean maybe younger engineers that he interacted with. I I don't have any that spring directly to mind, even though I'm, I'm conscious I have been told many, you know, as I discussed uh, or mentioned earlier, I, I spent a, a lot of time, well, you know, a, a day or so with, with Ralph and a couple of days with Charles Ripley. And a lot of those came up. Um, And I can't remember any of them for for the life of me at the moment. So there are lots around. Um, I'm sure Dick Goodman has filled his book with them um, because certainly there's there are a lot um, that circulate. Um, I just can't bring them to mind right now. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Let's take another and uh, audience one, and then I'll wrap up with one of my own. Um, sorry, I'm I'm on double duty today, so I'm picking through these questions as well. Uh, we have a student who asks, "How?" This is a very specific technical question, but I feel like we have to have one of these today. How dangerous are landfills to soil in the long run? And what problems do you foresee in soil and soil properties as a result of human waste that may not be solvable as we reach peak trash here in the next several decades? That's a very interesting one. And actually, as it turns out, it's one that I've had to look at quite quite carefully in the context of multiple landfill closures. And there isn't a, a simple answer because a lot defend, depends on the landfill and the waste that it contains. One landfill that I designed will have almost no impact because the hydrogeology meant that everything flowed into the landfill you, and it was basically a self-healing landfill. Others, we had a plume of heavy metals and other stuff moving through the soil. So that has multiple issues because it may change the soil chemistry uh, for better, or for worse. It also introduces contaminants, unhealthy contaminants into the soil that's moving away and, and downstream towards population. This is a problem. Um, I think the changes on the soil chemistry are perhaps ones that we don't appreciate and don't study enough, and it's something that we need to be looking at a lot, lot more um, in the future and a lot more carefully um, as we move forward. So a lot depends on the details of the soil, um, or sorry, the geomaterial at, at the site. And I say geomaterial because it may be a, a rock, it may be a weak rock, and um, that can create problems. Very good. I think that that's a super complete answer. Uh, you nailed a lot of viewers questions here today. I'm going to throw you a softball here for an easy one for your final one. Um, I'm a rock lover too. And so I had to put this one in here. What What is your all time? I, I don't know if favorite is necessarily the right question, but to you, what's the most interesting rock? It can be either a piece of rock or geologic formation that you've gotten to see in person in your life.
I, I think I don't know that I have a favorite per se. Uh, certainly, there there would have to be a few uh, that would be right up there. Um, one of them was my grandfather had collected a sample of sandstone from India. And, you know, it was um, a piece of rock that was like an inch by two inches by six inches. And it was flexible. You know, you could bend it like a piece of, of rubber. And, and unfortunately, I've lost um, the, the sample that someone acquired it from my desk um, when I had it in the office um, at one stage. Um, so that would have to be up there. Um, I, I spent time working at Lahir gold mine in Papua New Guinea. Now this is a gold mine in an active geothermal system where we had um, rocks at well above boiling temperature. So you had to deal with um, the physics of you know, rock as hot as 300 degrees Celsius um, and how you're going to mine it, how you're going to keep controlling it. But I, one of the consequences of all of that was that you had active silica and active um, and hydrite deposition. And I collected a few rocks from there that were really um, quite spectacular with the silica deposition process and really showing, you know, just how rocks alter in, in these sorts of, of influences. They they were quite quite cool a, as well. Um, I think those would probably be the be the couple that you know spring immediately to mind. That's that's an impressive list, even if it's short like that. Those, those are very, very unique. So I, I always say that I'm done and then I come up with one more. And so I think we'll close with this. This is a good way to wrap it all up. Uh, it can be something that you've worked on or just something you've been exposed to, whether it was in the news or a coworker looked at it or whatever. What modern problem, whether it's an engineering issue or a case history or, or whatever, do you think uh, your grandfather would be most interested in that we're facing now? within geotech i that that's always an a uh, really interesting one and, and and i think if you ask that question of of Carl at different stages he'd give of, of his career of his life he'd give very very different answers you know of course in his early days he was formulating the ideas he was very much you know advancement of humankind etc 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 in his later years he was getting a lot more into you know the sustainability the ecology and environmental aspects so i would think that if you ask the older uh, carl he would be saying you know it's the how do we make engineering sustainable what do we need to do how do we apply the principles that he helped develop to develop a more sustainable um, humankind. And, and certainly the discussions I had with Ruth, my grandmother, were very much pointed in that direction. And actually, 
um, with Vera, my my half aunt, um, she was saying exactly the same sort of thing that where she ended up having uh, five children and she never to told Carl about the last two because he was con already concerned very mu much back then, and this was the late 50s, early 60s, about um, how sustainable people were becoming. So I, I think that's the problem, that's the real challenge that he would be throwing himself into today. Very worldly. I mean, not that I would not expect that, but uh, that is an amazing answer. And really, I think a lot of information for thought for all of us as we go about our day and <laughs> throw a bunch of stuff in the trash and <laughs> the other wasteful ways we live our modern lives. Well, that was, thank you so much, Sergey, for your perspectives on these really varied issues. I think the presentation was great and gave people a lot of resources if they want to find out more about Carl. And certainly the information that you presented, too, was just some great anecdotes and some great quotes. Um, again, everybody watching, please get over to our Twitter feed. Check that out. We have the food that... Um, that we all made today in our jars and my taco in a jar is not looking so great. It's starting to run together, but it's going to hold up until dinner time. I think when it gets mixed with some other stuff, <laughs> we also, as a reminder, we have years of Terzaghi lectures posted to our YouTube channel right now. I believe we go back all the way to 2011 constantly. And as we find more, we are posting those. Tomorrow, for example, we'll have the 2008 Terzaghi lecture that was delivered by J.P. Giroux at Geo Congress 2008 in New Orleans posted. So you'll want to be on the lookout for those on our YouTube channel. There's all kinds of other good stuff up there as well. So check that out. We post new videos all the time. We would love to have you subscribe, get notifications, and then we'll let you know every time we post something, which is really frequently. Our next live stream, just like this, is going to be Geostrata Extra on October 21st, where we do an interview with an author from the most recent issue of our magazine. Subject will be Amusement Industry Geotechnics. And you can sign up for that on our Eventbrite page or look for the link directly on our YouTube channel. And we hope you'll join us and see you in the chat. We want to thank everybody who joined us from all over the world today, whatever time zone you're in. It's great to see so many people from all over the world. That, that makes us really happy. And this was, again, our sixth Terzaghi day, and I think it was the biggest and best so far, and in no small part because we were joined by Sergey. So, Sergey, thank you again for everything today. This was wonderful. You're welcome, and have a great day. And everyone, enjoy the rest of your Terzaghi day, and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks. I wasn't sure if I surprised you there, right? <laughs>